What an amazing experience it's been to be here today with all of you and to hear from this incredible creative treasure trove that has been gathered here. And so it's only fitting that I'll close the day by inviting you to imagine with me a world that works for everyone. It's time. We could do this. It's the 21st century. It's time for the world to work for everyone. A world that works for everyone assumes that every person has a gift. There's no one left out of not having and bringing a gift into the world. A world that works for everyone assumes that everyone has a destiny, a question, a call, a question from afar. What is my life meant to become? Who am I? What is my contribution? And imagining that a world that works for everyone assumes that there's a place that needs the gift, like Enoch started us today with understanding the importance and the power of place. And so imagine that each of us has a gift and has a destiny and a place that needs the gift. And on a day like today, listening to our many uh, remarkable speakers, well, that's not so hard to do, right? These are some of the most gifted people we'll ever meet. They are not only reaching for their own destiny, their own question, the answer to the question that their life calls of them, but they're reaching for something more for everyone, right? Even in the delivery of a, of a countertop to a place for people who've come out of prison, who've worked on that countertop to drive that to New Jersey. That's not just about one's own destiny, one's own success. It's about humanity. It's about dignity for everyone. And so what I've been trying to understand for a long time now is what does it mean to imagine a world that works for everyone for everyone? What does it mean to imagine a world that works for everyone? For my friend Ken Berg, who when I met him, actually he still is these things, but when I met him, he's about the most labeled person that you'll ever meet. He's deaf, he's blind, he's profoundly cognitively impaired, he has no language at all, he has severe seizures. In this picture that was taken, he's so self-abusive that he wears a helmet and a face mask and arm splints to keep from hitting himself and hurting himself. He'd, he'd hurt himself terribly at this age. And at the time this picture was taken, he was 13 years old, and his mother saw this picture and she said, ah, it's not okay. It's time for Ken Berg to become a man. In my culture at age 13, this isn't, this isn't being a man. What does it mean to be a man? So Claire and Ken and teachers and principals and good educators came together and said, what does it look like to imagine a world that works for Ken Berg? Because if we can do that for Ken, maybe we can do this for everyone. And so they practiced the art of person-centered planning, which is a creative process, a design process. And there are many aspects, but in the most simple way, it begins by listening with care. If we believe that there's a possibility for Ken, we will listen with different ears. We will see with a different eye. We'll imagine with and for him by learning about who is this person. And we'll find the key, that there's a key in Ken. There is this gift. It's like a DNA, right? It's kind of like the soul's DNA. And I have to tell you, having practiced this with thousands and thousands of people, I believe this with all my, every thread in my body, right? I believe the soul has a DNA. And if we listen closely enough, we can find that for every single person, especially when we start young. And that we have to support and find a place for that gift to emerge, to evolve. Without a place, it's not going to grow. And so for Ken, you know, it's a challenge, right? You got a kid like that who's about as complicated as you can get. And, um, but, you know, when we listen with care, a pattern always emerges. We've talked a lot today about the 
power of a pattern in design. And I think design thinking helps us see that people have a pattern. That's where our DNA can be seen. So with Ken, it was things like he really loves to be around animals and he responds to lots of smells. And his mother says when he visits my grandmother, his grandmother in Uruguay on a farm, he's just so happy he doesn't hurt himself at all. He's alive and when he's moving all the time, he's happy. And boy, if I could imagine a world that works for Kenny, I would see him on a farm. But to add insult to injury in this story, we're doing this plan in New York City. So now we got to find a farm in New York City? Well, guess what? When you go looking, sometimes you find the place that you're imagining. And there is a farm in New York City. It happens to be a museum. It's called the Queens County Farm Museum. It's 200 years old, but it's a 400-acre working farm. And there is something that really needs to be done there. There's a couple of chicken coops. And there's no one there to get the eggs out from under the chickens. And well, you know what happens when no one's doing that? They don't really keep laying more of them. And so Ken began his career at the Queens County Farm Museum 14 years ago, taking the eggs out from under the chickens. He, uh, he still does that. 14 years later, he generates about 15 cartons a day. They're labeled with Packed with Care by Ken. It's not the only thing he does, because it's kind of hard to do that. 30 hours a week, he works at the farm 30 hours a week. By the way, you know, people were nervous about these eggs because they're so fragile, but Ken is like the first time he went there. It's like his DNA knew these eggs needed care. He was so careful. Chickens were a different matter. Ken figured out right away the chickens were in the way, and he threw them across the coop. But you can see from this picture that chickens are really fast learners, and when this guy, Ken Berg, walks into the chicken house, they all just go flying, and his work is just, you know, almost done for him. And so that's not the only thing he does. He does all kinds of things there at the farm. But this is the most important aspect of it is he belongs to a group of 40 people there who care about this place. They care about each other. They care about Ken. And once a year they gather for Thanksgiving and they have a moment of the beloved community in which everyone there knows they, they really are touching in on something important. They're caring for the earth. They're caring for this place. They care for each other, and this guy, Marty, on the right, he's the director of education. He takes about 10,000 public school kids from New York City through the farm every year, and he goes out of his way every Thanksgiving to raise a toast to Kenny, who he says, every group of students who comes through this farm, I try to go out of my way to be sure they see Kenny and they meet him because I want every child to know that no matter who they are and what they're up against, there's a place for them. There's something important for them to do in the world. So Kenny's not just a farmer, he's a teacher. And just this September, he moved into his own apartment uh, with support. And this is the tree outside of his window, which is kind of fascinating, because you know, in New York City and apartment complexes, you don't often see trees like this, but I think it kind of symbolizes that, that, that DNA, that the, a tree knows how to grow, right? It has its code. And if the conditions are good enough, it grows into itself. And that's what we've learned from Ken. Well, one person isn't enough. This is Ken, by the way, today. Is this the face of someone who is standing in the place of grace? But, you know, one person's not enough. What does it look like when we think about this for 40 people? And I've had a chance to be involved with a number of young people in New York City who've gone through a similar process of taking their space and making their place and finding their shape. And they do that using art and investigation, discovery. M many of these kids are living in neighborhoods that are just as labeled as they are. They're neighborhoods that have the highest crime rates in America, the highest murder rates, neighborhoods that most people on the outside see as nothing but trouble, but on the inside, when we look with a different eye, we see different possibilities in the neighborhood. And sometimes it really takes getting on your shoes and making a picture of your neighborhood and finding out what goes on there, doing it together. So what happens in this particular group of young people is that they believe that everybody can work 
that every person with a disability, or no matter what your label, there is a job in New York City, even in a recession, even in a situation where 20 to 30 percent of high school graduates don't even have a job. This organization believes they have that vision. And so here's my friend David, who loves law and order. He's obsessed with it. And, um, he uh, not only volunteers at the Brooklyn Courthouse, but he works in a law firm doing all kinds of really important things there. And Rodney works in a gym right down the street from where he lives with his mother. A big question that resonates with the thinking of today is we often look at what's within walking distance, right? Like, what's right outside? What can people get to on their own without too much trouble? Christina loves fashion, works at Daffy's downtown. Uh, works there 30 hours a week. She's been there 14 years. Many of these young people have been working there 14 years. Jonathan works at a bookstore. He's also an amazing artist, amazing artist. The artwork people are making is incredible. David loves sports, and he has a job folding inventory at the NBA store on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Well, not everything lasts forever, okay? It's the real world. Many people here lost their jobs and so forth. They've been downsized. Uh, the MBA store closed. David now works at CVS, and he says it's not nearly as glamorous, uh, but the employee discount is really good. <laughs> and that makes up for it. This is, I love this story because this woman's name is Dominique. She's from the Dominican Republic. She wanted to work with children. And until people started to look for her DNA in a place where she could uh, take her shape, they didn't realize that there's a Dominican child care center right across the street from where she lives, right? I mean, come on, sometimes it's weird, right? Quirky. Dominique, Dominican child care, oh, right across the street. That child care center's been there for 21 years, and so is she, but wow, we made the connection. Tony has become a gospel promoter. Uh, he spent many years in a sheltered workshop, but he's organized gospel concerts for three and 400 people, 12 and 15 gospel choirs coming together to have a grand celebration in community. Jack grew up in an institution for most of his life. No one ever imagined he could work. He's getting close to 60. Most of the people I've been sharing are, are younger people. We started thinking about their future when they were 16 or 17. But, you know, Jack and the next person, Tony, reminds us it's, we're ne it's never too late. Jack has always wanted to work, and he loves animals, and he finally has his first job, got it in the recession, paid work, minimum wage at a pet store, socializing cats, that's what the owner says. What Jack says is that my job is to put love into cats. That works for me. Now, and this is his roommate, Tony, who also grew up in that institution. And Tony loves the high life in New York. He loves the stars and fashion and glamour and glitz and all that. And so he has a job at the Hard Rock Cafe, uh, giving out menus and being a cool dude at the Hard Rock Cafe. And Leon is a really fine artist, and he now has two different jobs teaching art in schools, and he's also become a really fine artist. He's being represented by a, a gallery in New York City, and his art is uh, in the visionary art shows. He's being collected by collectors all over the world. It was there all along, but uh, it, until people decide to look for it, it didn't show up. This is one of uh, Leon's paintings, Let Beauty In. And so what I've been trying to understand and learn from the people who are the most labeled and the least likely to be seen as people for whom the world can work is that when we go looking for beauty, we just might really find it. But you know what? If we're not looking for it, we surely won't. If we're not looking, we're not going to find it. And I don't want to mislead you because this is hard, right? We know that. Come on. These kids and their families are up against discrimination and segregation and a rejection that you and I can't imagine. They've lived most of their lives feeling invisible and useless and as if they're a burden to their families and society. The, the, the obstacles are relentless. The conditions are overwhelming. But you know what? When you have a vision, when you believe that your DNA matters, that your soul has a code and you're going to live it no matter what, you know, the, the complexity and the difficulty makes you stronger. If you don't have a vision, it'll crush you, right? 
And that's one reason we have to bring our fine minds to changing the organizations and the institutions that support everyone, not just these kids, everyone, your schools, uh, everyone. Because our institutions and our organizations have ossified. They crush people's creativity and possibility because we're trying to fit them into these tiny little ideas that are based on stereotypes and limitations and constriction and Leon reminds us that not only is beauty more likely to be found when we're looking for it, but if we have a vision and we've made it together with other people, that we can perhaps survive the challenges that are face us every day and endure the hard times because we're doing it together. And now we're going from 40 people to several thousand, and I'll make this... Um, I'll kind of sum this up, but this is a group of mostly women. After this morning's video, I had a whole different idea about why they're mostly women, but anyway, you guys know what I mean. Um, the idea with this, um, with this photograph is that because this is hard, it's important that we do it together. It's important that we join forces in small or large groups, um, wherever we are. And this is a group of women, mostly women, who provide direct support to people with disabilities and other people who are marginalized. And they've worked together with their partners and each other to develop their own vision. It's very much like the project management that we heard about. They, they all, except it's not a project, I don't mean to say people's lives are like that, but they decide with the support of their organization that they're not going to be just workers, that they are going to be artists, that they are going to make something important happen, not only on behalf of a person they care for and about, but also for themselves, that life becomes more interesting. Everything becomes more interesting when we see our work as artwork and we see what we're doing with each other and after Jay's presentation this morning, I actually saw these storyboards that they're working on as QR codes, right? They're incredibly subversive because they're pathways out, they're maps out of segregation and discrimination and isolation, and they're maps for, toward freedom for people who haven't had an ally in thinking about what's possible. And so these women, along with lots of other people that I've had a chance to think with these things about, have worked together to make many uh, stories using art, because art is not only a part of the process of this work, uh, but also it's a part of seeing our work as artists and as creatives, as inventors of human dignity and value, and that it involves both imagination and care, that it involves the work of the hands, but not just the hands, the heart, the dedication, right, that we heard about before. Not just the head, but the head counts too. And not just intelligence, but the imagination, the possibility, the commitment to all of these things, hands, hearts, and heads. These are all images that they designed to help tell the world about their work and how important it is to understand. And so I'm inviting us all and closing really with this possibility that we all imagine a world that works for everyone. And this is a picture of uh, a young person uh, over at the West Broad YMCA that's working with Molly Lieberman and Tina Hicks uh, on uh, an effort here to bring to life the possibility of beloved community for these young children. And so what might we do together to make sure this happens? I love their motto, and I'm going to close with this. Um, well, to close with two more things, but um, here's their motto, make things and be nice. Now, you know what's interesting about this is, I don't know how many of you heard, but just this Monday, the Dalai Lama was awarded the Templeton Award for being an entrepreneur of the spirit. And in his acceptance speech, he said the 21st century could be the first time in history that is based on peace and compassion. 
that it's possible. It could be time to do that. And what he says is how we're going to get there is not going to be ab about prayer and meditation. How about that? The Dalai Lama's not through prayer and meditation, but through education. By building an educational reality that's based on the whole person, right? Everything we've talked about and thought about today. And I think when we make things together, when we invent, when we project and we, we work together both artistically and as artists, that's, um, that's what's possible. And so um, I'd like to invite everybody on this journey to the beloved community that's going to be um, happening here at the Telfair Museum and the Chatham Savannah Citizen Advocacy Office. Tom Kohler's really involved in this for three months, so really longer than that. A number of things will be happening around Savannah. So come join us on the journey to the beloved community. We're not sure where we're going with this, but we are sure we're going to get there for all, for everyone. So join us. Thank you very much.